days, the wind has been in the south. It shook and played in the moors and went dandering up the sleeping grampians. But it brought more heat than cold, and all the parks were fair parched, sucked dry. The red clay soil of Kinradi gaping open for the rain that never seemed coming. Some said the north that had rain enough, with a dee in spate, and bairns hooking stranded salmon down in the shallows. But that was up Aberdeen way, where I was born and lived for my first 16 years. We dwelled then on the croft of Cairn Dhu in Echt. My father was John Guthrie and my mother Jean. I was their only daughter and they called me Christine. Christine? Chris, are you in by? I'm in the kitchen, Mother. But says you're out now. Oh, do you never tire of all your schooling and reading, lass? No, I like it fine. And Father says if I stick in at my lessons, I might come out to be a teacher myself. I was very pleased when you were in that bursary. You'd like to be a teacher, wouldn't you? I'd like it real well. Chris Quine, you spend our much time with your books when you could be out being happy. Your best days are now, Chris. When you're neither bairn nor woman, there's the countryside your own and you it's. But for all my reading and schooling, two Chris Guthrie's there were that fought for my heart and tormented me. You'd hate the land and the coarse speak of the folk one day, and the learning would be brave and fine. Then next day, you'd waken with peewits crying across the hills, deep and deep, crying in the heart of you, and the smell of the earth in your face. Almost you'd cry for that, the beauty of it, and the sweetness of the Scottish land and skies. And you wanted the Scots words to tell it to your heart. Then the moment passed. And you became the English Chris again. Back to the English words, so sharp and clean and true. For a while. For a while. Till they slid so smooth from your throat. You knew they could never say anything that was worth saying at all. He's got a fine plump belly on him, eh, Walter? Aye, has that. Father rode him all the way from Aberdeen after he bought him. What's he called? Well, his name's Prince. But I'll not call him that. I'll call him Jehovah. <laughs> That's a grand name, Will. Aye, I heard the minister used it in church one Sunday. I've been saving it up ever since. Eh? Get over, Jehovah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that you said, Will? I asked you what you called the horse. Jehovah. Oh. Mind my money. If I ever hear you again take your maker's name in vain, if I ever hear you use that word again, I'll lip you. Now you mind that? I'll lip you like a lamb. So Will hated father. He was 16 years of age and near a man. But father could still make him cry like a bear. The twins were born soon after, and Mother had as awful a time as she'd always had. She's in guy sort of pain, Father. Is there no sign of the doctor? He'll likely come in the evening. Say bad we twins. Aye, bad. Been bad before, but never less bad. Well, man, you wouldn't be told.
I can't. Solid. Uh. The doctor stayed the whole night. My brothers, Dodd and Dalek, shivered and cried in their room till father went up and scalped them right sore. They had something to cry for then, but they didn't care. Then he came downstairs again, though he hadn't been in bed for 40 hours, and sat with his head in his hands. God forgive me the lust of the flesh, this miserable sinner. It's the bonny red hair ever that rouses me and tempts my soul to hell. Have you nothing better than to stand there like a gulk? I, I came down to see to the towels. Then see to them. And set the table. The doctor will be wanting his breakfast. Lay it through in the parlor there. What'll I give him, Father? Boil him an egg. Move, damn you. It's near morning outside. I daren't. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, don't leave when you hear me. I, I hear you down to hell. I'm not there. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, Five, think. Would you like something to eat, Walt? I couldn't close my eyes up there for hearing Mother. I had no sleep myself. None of us have. It was as though she was being torn and torn in the teeth of beasts and couldn't thrill it any longer. Aye. That was the first being born. The other's still to come. Twins. Oh, she shouldn't be having one being much less twins. She's too old for that, and Guthrie kens it. Father. Aye, father, the old beast. But, well, what's father to do it? Don't you know? Well, what's a bull to do with a calf, you fool? Here's your doctor, only she's feared. She was a damn sight more to fear, she's having a beard of her own. Pour out the water quick. Into the pile of the pair of you. So that was the coming of the twins at Cairn Doos. There'd been barely room for us all before that time. But when Mother spoke of it, Father wouldn't listen. More room. What more room do we want than we have? You think we're gentry? We're not gentry, but we're not tinks either. Though you might think it the way we're all living on top of one another. It was barely enough room before the twins came, but now there's eight of us. Eight? You have little to complain of. My own mother had nine bairns all at home in a place not half this size, just a button bairn in Petodre. We know how you lived in Petodre. We managed fine. And we must do the same. Be thankful if you do as well. My father was just a ploughman, but he brought us out to be God-fearing and decent. Aye, we must be that. Aye, we must. And I'll tell you this. If just one of your bairns turns out half as good, your face need never redden with shame. You might have some thought for Chris and Will. The lass is near full grown. She should have a room of her own. Cairndoo's not big enough for all of us. That's a fell good farm. 
You know, it took years of sweat and charming to get the hardness out of the land. Aye. And the hardness has gone elsewhere. Times I think you love that land better than any of us. Or your own soul, even. If there's to be no more rooms, there's to be no more bairns. There shouldn't have been anyway. Four of a family was fine, now there's six. Fine? We'll take what God in his mercy may send to us, woman. Now see you to that. I'm taking up the lease again. Well, well. We're to bide on here, then. We are that. So content yourself. your cart. You're causing an obstruction. How can I move it? With a poor beast half feared to death. And no wonder. You come around that corner there, spitting and barking like a tank dog with distemper. Oh, boy. Oh, oh. I said you're causing an obstruction, my man. I am not your man, thank God. For if I was, I'd take a shovel and scrape the muck and paint off your face before giving it a damn good wash. Take a note of his nameplate, you hear? Take a note of his nameplate. Go on, my manny. Do as the Dutch of the gentry tells you. It's Guthrie. John Guthrie. Mr. John Guthrie. You haven't heard the last of this, Mr. Guthrie. We're leaving, can do. Aye. He was in a fair rage when he was told they weren't renewing the lease. Your woman was a friend of the landlord's, a cousin or something. <laughs> Still, it might teach Guthrie to keep a civil tongue in his head. He'll be guy sore at having to leave. Yeah, maybe, but he's got no choice now. <coughs> Mother will be pleased, though. Where'll we go? Blaweary, it's called. Blaweary? Aye, sinking Raddy down in the hollow of the Mairns. What's the house like, John? Oh, it's a fine, brave house for a wee place. It has three stories and a good kitchen. And there's a fair stretch of garden down to the road. A garden? Aye, and there's beech trees growing in it. And the agent said the hedges in the summer grew as bonny with honeysuckle as you ever saw. Sounds a right fine place. Aye. And if we're going to live in the smell of honeysuckle, we might farm the bit place with profit. It hasn't had a tenant for a year. And the parks will need a fell amount of work. Fifty-six acres of red clay. For buy some moor that runs up to a lock at the top. Can Raddy the Mairns? It's guy far away. Well, there's no place like Aberdeen. Or folks are fine as them that bide by the dawn. But I think I'll like your Blaweary well enough. When do we move? January. And it's an old month to be moving. Wild weather it was that January. And the night on the slug road was smoring with sleet when we crossed over into the mountains. The cattle bunched them, tails to the wind, refusing the sting of the sleet. South across the uncouthy hills was a world cold and unchancy. Come and well! Keep the cattle moving! John! John! We'd better loosen up at Port Leather and not try the slug road this night! What was that? We'd better put up at Port Leather. Come to hell! You think I'm made a seller? No, I don't. But if the carts get stuck again, we might all die of the night. This is the worst, bet. Once we're over it, Kid Roddy's just ahead. Have you no sense, young lad? Keep them moving. So that was our coming to blow weary in Kid Roddy of the Merns. We slept late into the next morning, coming up cold and drizzly from the sea. All the darkness I heard that sea, a shoom shoom that moaned by the lonely cliffs. Not that John Guthrie listened to such sounds. Well, Chris, get up! How many times do you have to be shouted? There's work to be done and gear to be shifted. You should be sick with your shame at yourselves, lying there, stinking your beds with the day half gone. You two, set that fire before I warm your backside for you. Go on, hurry up! Aye, the new folk had a 
fear barred night for moving into Blavili. They had that, Che. I've never seen the like. Eh. Uh, it hasn't been your old buyer much good either. God, uh, Mrs. Monroe, this is an awful buyer you have. It must leak like a sieve at times. It's good enough for the likes of us. Oh, aye, as you say. Aye, it's good enough for poor folks like us. And who's poor? Let me tell you this, Chase Draken. We've never needed anybody to come to our help. Though we don't boast and blow about it all over the countryside, like some I could mention. Oh, I meant no offence, Mrs. Monroe. No offence of any kind. Your old place has nothing to blow about. Oh, no, no, I wouldn't say that. Peas is not a fine wee farm. Aye, and your parks have a fine black loam, Che. Not red clay like the rest of Conradi sits on. Ah, it would be. But in a scanner, yeah, that you can't so much as change your shirt without some old fashioned brute staring in it. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't bother me or Kirsty. No, it's the yeah. smell that bothers your wife. Oh, what's a bit of guff? If she'd come across some of the smells I did in South Africa, she'd never as much as notice them. Much less ran boring to the neighbours about them. Well, she won't have so far to run now that the new folk have moved yeah. into Blawiri. Have they? Aye, Guthrie. John Guthrie, I'm told. Some creature from up north. I live a hard time with Blawiri. It's coarse land, but it's kind of lonely up there in the brae. You have spoken to him? No yet, but uh, can't take it up to see if Mrs Guthrie needed any help. Oh, likely they will. It's a true enough saying, out of the world and into Blawiri. <laughs> Who'd think a place could get into such a state in a 12 months with nobody living in it? It's right good of you to help, Mrs. Strachan. That's no more than neighbourly. And my name's Kirsty. She would have come with me, but he promised to stop by at Cuddiston to mend the roof of their buyer. Oh, he's a handy billy chee if you want anything done. He'll live a calf, lick in a horse, kill a pig, all in a jiffy. You mentioned the Cuddiston. Is that the place down by the crossroads? Aye, the Monroe's farm. Same size as pieces now. Now, you wouldn't think it to hear Monroe talk. He can blow and bombast till he fair scunners you. There is little enough for easy. The place is needed, been mucked for a harvest this spring. That may be a cow from Monroe's neck. His neck? Some folks say he can't get the mud washed out of it. Others say he's never tried. <laughs> You're not friends, then? Oh, aye, friends enough. There's worse folk than Monroe. The chases maybe they're all in jail. <laughs> ah, but no harm to the pair of them. She's always ready to go out at any time of the night when some poor Billy comes trapping at her window. And why is that? Oh, she's the best midwife for miles around. It's fine to have one handy. Oh, aye, she's out before you can whistle and snap in her order around the kitchen and tell the poor soul in child bed she would easily be worse. <laughs> Druids work, they say. That's what they say. They were set up by the Druids. He'll be the new tenant at Blawiri. Aye. Guthrie. John Guthrie. Yourself? Rob Duncan. Long Rob, they call me. I work the mill. So likely we'll be seeing each other. Likely. It's rough, coarse ground about here. Oh, it's that. I'm a bit like it myself. And I've been sweating and shoving away for three years to turn it into a park. But, oh, it's no half done yet. Well, trade must be slack at the mill if you have time to waste on it. Oh, make time, man. I'm working when the rest of Conradi's away to bed. And I'm out again at the cake a day before the half of them's up. Uh, keeps me at it from Monday to Sunday. Let's away some dark splatter of water. They say there's no bottom to it. Like the depth of a parson's depravity. Now, that's an ill thing to say about any minister. It's an ill thing to say about any loch. You'll get hard on the kirk, Mr. Duncan. Well, I've as much time for it as it has for me. And that's no much. I'm an atheist. Though, if Christ came down to Kinradi, he'd be welcome enough to a bit meal or milk at the mill. But damp the thing he'd get at the manse. These were the first of the Kinradi folk we met. But as that winter wore on and spring came in, we soon got to know the others right well, as well as they knew one another. Oh, why, Alec Much is a grand worker. And Bridge End's no the worst farm in Kinradi. But it's well kenned he's up to his great big muckle years in debt. No wonder well he's a slummock like her for a wife. Cigarettes never out of her mouth. She's a speak half the men's we are smoking. There's never a mortal thing worries her. She I just lights up a cigarette like a tink and says, Ah, well, it'll make no difference a hundred years after I'm dead. 
I pay no attention to what they say, though some of them have fine notions of themselves. Like God of Upper Hill. <laughs> you steal with Alec, that's my husband, says about him. <laughs> He struts about with his stick as proud as a cock in a midden. Oh, Gordon Clare fancies himself with his big farm and his leggings and his breeches. Mrs. Gordon's the same. Her father was some bitch post office creature up in Stonehaven. Oh, God, to hear her talk, you would think he'd invented the post office and taken out a patent for it. Uh, and she's a fierce scanner when she starts talking about her two lassies. Of course, Nellie and Maggie Jean go to Stonehaven Academy. <laughs> I'm very anxious to learn not to speak coarse. Oh, they're so intelligent, I'm sure they'll be a great credit to me. Mind you, Maggie Jean's awful delicate. Yes, I had to take her to a specialist in Aberdeen just recently. Now, when I took my pig to see the specialist in Edinburgh, he up and said, Mr. Rob, this is a most unusual pig, but so intelligent. And you should send him to the academy, and someday he'll be a real credit to you. Ah, you know, there's no secret in Kenradi, Chris. What did Mrs. Gordon say? Well, she turned as red as fire, and she forgot her English, and she cried out, Rob Duncan's a Nora Tink Brute. Oh. <laughs> Chris, get on with your studies. You've no time for Daphne, and you will leave her alone. Oh, I think the lassie does too much studying as it is. I never see you out with your friends, Chris. The only quines of my own age are the servants up at the mains. You'll stay away from them, do you hear? They're nothing but gugs and gomerals screeching around the barn at night with the plowman snickering after them. The lassie needs friends. Friends? Stick to your lessons and make a name for yourself. You've no time for friends. Take care her head doesn't soften with lessons. Books and learning can send for clean skate. Would you rather see her skate with learning or skate with... With what, John? With the sort of things that can happen in a godless parish like this. Kinradi may or may not have lacked a god, but it certainly lacked a minister. And three of them came down to try for its empty pulpit. What's today's candidate like? Cahoon's his name. He's an arls but man for banff. Well, he might be best. He'll quieten down at his age. No idea on the lookout for a bigger kirk and a bigger stipend. Aye, you're right there, Alec. For if there's a body on earth that can skin a tink for his skin or preach a sermon in purgatory, it's an old kirk minister. I'm told he spent years writing books and things. And likely all his spunks trickled out of his pen. No, no, there's no harm in books. Maybe no, but I hope he doesn't read his sermon. The Raddy's no liking for a minister that reads his sermon. But he did read his sermon. And that fair settled his hash to begin with. So hardly a soul paid heed to his reading. Except myself and John Guthrie. But I thought it fine. He told of the long dead beasts of the Scottish land. In the times when jungle flowered its forests across the how, and a red sun rose on the steaming earth that the feet of man had still to tread. And he pictured the dark, slow tribes that came drifting across the low lands of the northern seas. The great bear watched them come. And they hunted and fished and loved and died. God's children in the morn of time. And he brought the first voyages sailing the sounding coasts. And they built the heathen idols of the great stone rings. The golden age was over and past. And lust and cruelty trod the world. But this too passed and Christ was arisen. A pinpoint of cosmic light far off in Palestine. The light that crept and wavered and did not die. The light that will yet shine as the sun on all the world. Not least on the dark house and hills of Scotland. Let us pray. He seems to think and that is the right course place since all the jungles dried up. Aye, and his prayers were guy short. Have you a word to say for the king of royal family at all? That's well, Ken, you're a great king's man, Alec. Ready to die for him every day of the week and twice on Sundays. 
Still, I didn't think much of the Reverend Cahoon myself. Because he didn't praise up your socialism, eh? That's what sermon should be about, how the rich and poor should be equal. What are you, Sybil Weary? I liked him fine. You'll get my vote. You'll get faint few others. doesn't like anybody touching his shotgun. Nobody must handle it but himself. You've heard him say it. Ah, it's only an old muzzle loader. Please, Will, he'll be fell angry if he finds out. Well, he'll not find out. Hey, did you hear what Rob Duncan said about this? Will, please. He cried out, Hi, man, I didn't know you were a veteran of the 45. And Guthrie comes back with, Losh, Rob, were you cheating for get your mill even then? Oh, my father can take a bit joke now and then. From everyone except his family. touching my shot bag. And why would I want to do that? Well, some of you have us. There's barely enough here for one charge. So where are they? Hold your wish, John, you and your gun. Now, Gina, I'm asking you a question. What harm was in Will that he used it? You were using the gun, eh? Hi. Come out to the barn with me, Will. Father, you can't. Quiet, Chris. Will's near 17. He's over all to be Quiet, murdered. quiet, else I'll take you as well. Father's roused, lass. You might as well cry to the tides at Kenef to keep away from the land. You saw, didn't he? Oh, I can hardly, hardly sleep for the pain it Chris. Oh, I hate him, Chris. I hate him. After a while, he stopped crying and fell asleep. And strange it seemed to me then, for I knew him bigger and older than I was. And somehow, skin and hair and body, stranger than once they had been. As though we were no longer children. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed... The Reverend life. Stuart Gibbon was the third minister to make a try for the Kinradi Mans. And as I looked up at him, I knew well he'd please the Kinradi folk. His sermon, it was out of the Song of Solomon. And well and rare he preached it. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels. The work of the hands of cunning craftsmen. Thy navel is like an round goblet which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like an heap of wheat set about with lilies. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. The Song of Solomon has more meaning than one. 
It is Christ's description of the beauty and fine comeliness of the Kirk. And it is also a picture of womanly beauty, which moulds itself in the life and grace of that Kirk. As such, it is a perpetual manual for the women of Scotland, so that they may attain straight and fine lives in this world, and salvation in the next. I'm no saying but what he said the prayers right well. Aye, and there was one or two of them joined in right near the end, and that's guy seldom done in the old kirk. Mind you, he begged to be forgiven for his sins and not his trespasses. And what's the difference? Well, uh, trespasses sound more genteel. Oh, he's a pretty man and no mistake. Right, Carly Bull. Aye, there was fair tickle to hear things like that read from the pulpit about a woman's breasts and thighs. Gee. And to know it was decent scripture with a higher meaning as well. Aye, oh, I heard about him, the Reverend Gibbon. <laughs> well, preaching like that's a fine way of having your bit pleasure by proxy right in the front stalls of the kirk. I prefer to take mine more private, like. Well, there's few that would put off tramping in to vote for him. No doubt. I heard they all sat there listening to him as though he was promising to pay their taxes at Martimus. Likely you'll be seeing him soon. Oh, you think so? Since the beginning of time in Kinradi, every minister has made a round of the parish when he was inducted. Some of them did it quick, and some did it slow. I think the Reverend Gibbon's one of the quick. Oh, it's coarse land hereabouts, Mr. Gibbon. Wet and raw most of the time. Parched and sucked dry, like now, when there's a drought. Aye, as you say, as you say. It's only a man from the north who could handle it so well. A man like yourself, Mr. Gibbon. Aye. Come here, Quine, and meet Mr. Gibbon. This is my daughter, Chris. Mm-hmm. Well, girl, have you lost your tongue? How do you do, sir? Yeah, fine-looking lass, Mr. Guthrie. I hear you're right clever, Chrissy. She does well enough. She's at the college. And how do you like it, eh? Fine, sir. Ah, good, good. It takes education to smooth the path through life, as I'm sure your father's told you. Aye, sir. Uh-huh. What is it you want to be? Like fine to be a teacher. Ah, you couldn't have a better ambition. There's no profession more honorable. I'm sorry I had to dash away, Mr. Gibbon, but if I don't put the twins to bed when they... Oh, want don't to go... apologize, Mrs. Guthrie. I've been quite content sitting here listening to your husband's conversation and enjoying your excellent tea. Let hmm? me get you another cup. Ah, uh, thank you. No, I must be dandering along now. Well, it's been a pleasure meeting you, Mr. Guthrie. And Mrs. Guthrie. I'll uh -huh. just see you down the road, Mr. Uh, Gibbon. thank you. Thank you. Come over and see us some evening, Chrissy. Maybe the wife and I will be able to lend you some books to help in your studies, eh? Hmm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought since I was passing, I'd just stop by and see how you were, Jean. Oh, I'm fine, Kirsty. To be a while yet. Oh, hi, Chris. Hello, Mrs. Drake. What are you doing in a day like this? Please, there hasn't been a drought like this since 83. As the Lord Rob says, you can't blame this one in Gladstone. <laughs> Religio Medici. That's a queer like name for a book. I got a loan of it from the minister. Oh, you've been up at the manse then, have you? Did you meet Mr. Skippen? No, she was busy with her spring cleaning or something. Mm -hmm. I hear she's a bonny enough young thing in a thin kind of way. I'm told she's some English creature he married in Edinburgh. You can tell they're right fond of each other. Oh, why? I hear they kiss every time he goes out for a bit of a walk. You can hear a lot of things about other folk in Kinradi. Oh, but it's true, though. Once he came back from a bit of a jaunt and found her waiting for him, so he picked her up in his arms and ran upstairs, the both of them cuddling one another. Chris, away up and strip the beds, your own and Will's. You can give me a hand to wash the blankets. Aye, Mother. It's true, though. I heard it from the servant quine. Heard that comes from Gordon. Heard what? But the minister and his wife into the bedroom they went and closed the door. And they didn't come down for hours. They're just bare in the middle of the afternoon. 
comes to the same thing at any time. Lad, Chris Quine. <laughs> Aye, John. Have you ever seen a drought the likes of this before? A shameless slimmer. Get your clothes on. What would folks say of the Queen if they saw her there, near naked? We'd be the speaking laughing stock of the place. Well, it wouldn't be the first time you've seen her naked lass yourself. And if your neighbours haven't, they must have fathered their own bairns with their bricks on. It had been as though I saw a caged beast peep from his eyes. Like a fire that burned across the close. It went on and on as though I still stood there and he glowered at me. I hid my face below the blankets, but I couldn't forget. Next morning, when I was able to bear thinking of it no longer, I went to Mother and asked her straight. I'd never asked her anything of the kind before. Oh, Chris, don't ask me. Men? Men and bairns, I, I can't tell you a thing or advise you a thing. Mother, what's wrong? Is it... I heard you talking to Kirsty Strachan. Oh, Mother, I didn't mean to vex. It's not you, Chris Quine. It's just life. <laughs> You'll have to face men for yourself when the time comes. There's none can stand and help you. Chris? Mind that for me sometime. If I can't, it's all it any longer. So what, Mother? What's the matter? Oh, we're daft, a pair of us. Away and fetch me a pail of water. I went out into the red hot weather. And then something came on me. I crept back, soft footed. And there Mother stood as I'd left her. White, lonely and sad. I didn't dare go into her. I just stood and looked. Something was happening to Mother. Things were happening to all of us. Nothing stayed the same, except maybe this weather. And if it went on much longer, the old minister's jungles would soon be sprouting back across the parks of the Howe. 
Somebody was crying on me. Mind that for me sometime, if I can't thaw it any longer.